Connecticut and Massachusetts, Z&M Homes buys houses. Sell your property to the local guys. Needs repairs, updates, maybe foreclosure or inherited? No problem. We got gotcha. you. Google or add us on Facebook at Z-A-N-D-M-Homes.com. It's Baxi's Musical Podcast. Praise you, sir. This is you, sir. If you ask most Americans what they know about the country of Norway, the answer is probably going to center around the Vikings and a Beatles song about wood. Other than that, that's pretty much all we got. The truth is, Norway is bursting with a rich, dynamic culture, a long history of international athletic competition, delicious cheeses, and plenty of artistic significance that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, the only reason I know any of this is because I had to look it up. And because I'm an ignorant American, the only reason I looked it up was because my guest today is Frederik Soroya from the Norwegian electro rock band Data Rock. Now, before you say, who is Data Rock, you should be aware that for the last 23 years, Data Rock's music has been featured by Coca-Cola, Apple, Google, Logitech, and several video game releases. Their music has been used all over American TV, including MTV, Nick Jr., and Comedy Central. It's been featured in several films as well. And while the name Data Rock may not be completely familiar to you, you've likely heard their music without even knowing about it, because that's how it was for me as well. But here's the thing. Data Rock is a band who's released five full-length albums and several EPs, and they've also released 21 singles, and they're awesome. The music of Data Rock is quirky, danceable, and wickedly inventive. Their music is both retro, and it also seems like it's from the future. Try figuring that out. Data Rock is a band that is totally worth getting familiar with, and their latest album, Media Consumption Pyramid, is no different. It also doesn't hurt when your lead singer's got a lot to say with a wicked sense of humor and a gigantic bag of great stories to go along with it. This is my conversation with Frederick Soroya, also known as Rocksteady Freddy from Data Rock on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Rocksteady Freddy. That's my name. That is it, man. I tell you, I have had so much fun gearing up for this interview, and, 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 and I'm listening to some of the older songs, and I'm realizing I've been listening to Data Rock songs for years, and I didn't even know it. I feel like I'm the last to know. <laughs> no, really? Okay. Are you serious? Okay, so... Where have you heard us? If you didn't know, it was us. Well, it it's funny because I mean I've heard fa 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 in in other uses other than just you know yeah. you know on uh, on record, and then I realized oh my god I do know these guys, and and mm-hmm. it never it didn't connect to me right away, but I've had so much fun listening to it. I mean, and the thing about it is the the story of this band I think is absolutely a fascinating one. I mean, you guys are a bunch of friends yeah. in high school. You start a band, no expectations of of being successful, and literally just in it to have fun that's how everybody starts yeah that's how everybody should start <laughs> but for you guys <laughs> things just blow up and and they blow up fast you you make a record and out of nowhere yeah. fa 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 becomes this you know, you know some of the biggest companies in the world are glomming yeah. onto this and using it for their own marketing tell me how this all happened it just it seems so improbably crazy to me no but but it is and i mean we i think we were very lucky to be there at that right time right because because um, when online started happening i don't think the major labels knew how to handle it you know <laughs> and every time you met because back then People working on, well, digital marketing and distribution, were, they were simply called online. They were online. Right. You know what I mean? So, so the, and these people were very young, right? So the, so the guys who came out of whatever college education, handling the digital aspects of even major labels, they were like 20-something, you know? And, they, and they, they probably liked us because we were kind of young and weird and crazy. So, so what happened, I think, was that, you know, marketing people and club promoters and festival booking teams and whatnot, they saw that suddenly the sort of the globally trending bands weren't your typical super well-established household bands, but you had MySpace bands, sure. right? Right. So, so out of nowhere, you have this huge global social media long, long, long before 
Facebook and all of that, and and kind of very different to like old school um, forums with just walls. Here you can also stream the music. You can see photos. You can even interact with the artist. And we befriended people all over the world. And somehow we ended up being front page of MySpace for two weeks, right? Which means 28 million people would see our faces every day when they open MySpace globally. And we were so used to to communicating with people online at the time, right? Because we were here in Norway and uh, ever since we started, everybody we knew were kind of pen, pen pals around the world. You know, people would order a CD from us. We would actually mail it in the mail or we made our own homepage. So we, we actually had a streaming variation on our homepage. So, so when all of this stuff with MySpace happened to us, it was just like, that's what happens. That's been happening for years, but we didn't understand how big MySpace was. So basically, just a few months after we were, we were, I think it was Artist of the Week or whatever it was called. So anyways, opening page, everybody logged When you logged in, you saw Data Rock and it was easy to press play and you heard Data Rock, right? And so so basically, we, we went from zero to 100 <laughs> this way. So we're, we're, we're featured artists on MySpace. And then a couple of months later, we get a phone call from Coca-Cola. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I think about I think about the way you know social media works today, and with the heavy yeah. algorithm, there's no way you could have any post available visually for two weeks. I mean, unless you're going to drop a ton of money on on no. Facebook or Instagram ads. I mean, it's just the algorithm is such yeah. is such horseshit. But yet, the fact that you yeah, were, no, you're right. And also, yeah. also back then, I mean, we started in 2000, and this was 2000. And, six i think five or six i don't remember exactly when it was the album was released march 2005 but i don't think this happened until pretty far into the kind of life of that album and things were still moving so slowly that you know art i mean you remember css sure and uh, you know digitalism and justice and all of this you know and and a song was kind of new for years remember <laughs> You yeah, know, a, a song was, was brand new for like three years. So you get this phone call from Coca-Cola wanting to use this. I mean, you, yeah. you guys must just have been floored by this. I mean, it's like, you know, they're one of the biggest companies in, in the world. Yeah. And here they are just, I wouldn't even believe them if if, uh, if Coke started to call uh, no. me. No, and I didn't either because I, I was, coincidentally, I was in, San, in um, I mean, in Amsterdam to play at a place called Perdiso. And and that was kind of a big deal because I think Flaming Lips was playing the day before. So so I mean, uh, anyways, we were in Amsterdam, Paradiso, and I, I remember me and my songwriting partner, Shetel uh, Musnes, we were sitting backstage drinking beer, and we were like, "What are we doing? We're adults. Why are we sitting here at this punk tour?" And <laughs> out of the blue, this co this reach out comes along, and it wasn't directly from Coca Cola. It was a Coincidentally, it was a Dutch company called Whedon and Kennedy, hmm. and we were in, we were in Amsterdam at the time. Coincidentally, the day before we wasn't, the day after we wasn't. No, we took it seriously because, we, but but we didn't realize it was a global campaign. We were just thinking, okay, so there must be a Coca Cola ad for Netherlands or something like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but then I'll tell you really a really hilarious thing. At the time, we had befriended these guys from from London. Uh, on a tour in Australia that year because we were touring with James Brown which is also fucking crazy we shared a backstage with James Brown <laughs> you know? all right hold on to that one because I want to hear about James Brown but go ahead go yeah. ahead yeah no, yeah no that's a pretty crazy story but on on that tour I'm just going to mention James Brown was touring with 27 people we were the three of us we didn't even have a sound engineer or anything so <laughs> you know we didn't think we were going to play the main stage of that tour so we thought we were going to just play, play a little tent in the corner of the fest, touring festival, you know. But when we realized we played the main stage on a stadium tour, we were kind of embarrassed for not having, you know, musicians on stage. And we really didn't have any equipment. We were traveling with hand luggage. Like our entire backing <laughs> tracks, our entire backing track production, we just sent from a goddamn mini disc. You remember the mini discs? <laughs> and, and our synthesizer was a Casio MT64, which I think you can buy for something like $25, you know? <laughs> and then we had a guitar and then a, a bass guitar. That's it. That's what we were traveling with. So I befriended the drummer of one of the other bands because he was, I mean, he was there, was going to be there every night. So I just asked him, would you mind just playing drums with us for a couple of songs? Because it's kind of embarrassing being on stage 
in front of 25,000 people and, <laughs> and, you know, you know, just to fill it in, you don't have to be particularly, you know, into the song, just play a beat, whatever. So I explained five songs to him and he came on stage with us, played a show for 25,000 people flawlessly right. <laughs> <laughs> without any rehearsals or anything. I just explained the songs for him right before we went on stage. So he became a really dear friend and we actually visited him for the release of this album, even on Friday in London. Anyways, this is the hilarious thing. His brother was the band leader of Robbie Williams. So when Robbie Williams wrote that uh, $200 million contract uh, in 2006, I don't, don't, don't know if you remember, but in 2006, he, he wrote world history's biggest music contract prior to Madonna and all of that, right? Right, huge. It was huge. And then this drummer and his brother and this whole group of friends that we had befriended, they were the people around Robbie Williams. So they, so I, told, so I called them and I said, hey, hey, who handled that goddamn contract for Robbie Williams? Because that must have been someone who knew, who knew what they were doing. And then they say, okay, it's these guys called Steph and Jill Davis, and they gave us the contact. And, and the first thing I did when I realized Coca-Cola contacted us was I got the same solicitor who handled Robbie Williams' $200 million <laughs> contract to <laughs> deal with Coca-Cola. Because we didn't know how to to respond to something like a Coca Cola ad. What the hell? So that was the. So we went from no, ev not ever being represented by any kind of <laughs> lawyer or manager or anything, going straight to writing the contract with Coca Cola with the same solicitor, who did the two hundred million dollar contract. That's unbelievable. <laughs> That's crazy. And at the time, we were still a punk band. You know, we were still sleeping on couches. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so t you got to tell me about James Brown. What, what what was that all? What was that like? Oh man, it was crazy. It was it was actually just I think half a year before he passed away, and he was the kind of the headliner of this touring festival in Australia called Good Vibrations. And I'm telling you, he was as good as ever. He was he was as good as any footage I've ever seen of him. He was he was completely amazing still. Yeah. It, it really shocking when he passed away because like everything you want to see from a James Brown show was there, like his dance moves, his energy, his um, uh, his voice, his every everything was just amazing. But we shared a backstage, and one day I went to take piss, <laughs> and uh, who do I run into in the bathroom but Mr. James Brown, right? Hopefully we we both washed our hands before we shook hands, but <laughs> but I shook his hand in the, in a backstage bathroom, and and it's very hard to explain this, but it was so scary. It was just so scary meeting him. Yeah. No, but it was something. I mean, I've met I met John Leckie, who's the producer of Stone Roses' debut album, and I'm you know I was completely in awe of meeting John Leckie, but I could still you know talk to him. I, I have a normal conversation with him. I mean, I've. I've met, of course, the Devo guys and all sorts of people, but they're not scary. You know, it's not scary meeting your idols. It's uh, weird and interesting and wonderful, but it's not scary. But James Brown, man, that was a <laughs> different story. I mean, <laughs> goddamn. And I remember just feeling this sensation of my life source just being sucked through my hand and into <laughs> his spirit or something like that. And I was like, I was, uh, I was kind of shaken by the whole thing. And, and I mean, this is 2006, and just talking about it is like, I met something evil that day. You know what I mean? <laughs> just something. It's a terrible thing for me to say, but but that's just how it felt. It's yeah. so odd. So you guys are on tour, and you know, Coca Cola is you know, coming to you, but then so is yeah. everybody else. It's you know, it's Apple, it's Google, it's Logitech, and Fa 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 is being used in movies and television. I mean, that just completely. Yeah blows up i mean it's not just one great deal it's a it's a whole big fat bunch of them and the amazing part yeah. about it is w when i listen to the first record I, I i as great as that song is there are songs in that record i like much better than fa 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 you know like it, 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 that's a very interesting thing to point out because when that album was was released it ended up uh being number 35 of the best albums of the year in new, mm -hmm. in uh, new musical express so uh, and every everything from rolling stone magazine and pitch because pitchfork back then was still a, like baby nerd blog in chicago you know <laughs> and we got to know those guys and so so everybody wrote about it so it was so weird we were reviewed all over the planet and we were just releasing it on our own label and it wasn't like 
we went to business school or anything. I don't even think we to this day has ever registered that label anywhere. It's just like, <laughs> it's a hobby thing, you know. We've released a bunch of friends and they get paid and everything, but it, 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 it's a very simple operation. I don't have a fucking clue how we got reviewed all over the planet. I don't know. I really don't know. But not a single one of them was talking about Fa Fa Fa. Not ever, not a single one. Well, that's just the thing. I mean, I I, I was listening to it a few days ago, and I thought like Laurie yeah. was fantastic. The, you know, yeah, the, everybody talked about Laurie. Yeah, everybody talked about Laurie and Computer Camp Love. Laurie, that's right. That's those are the two I was going to mention. And the and the funny part about it is, you know, Computer Camp Love. I mean, it's 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 so clearly Summer Nights from Greece, and you know, a song <laughs> yeah. about Laurie yeah. Anderson, which is you know. A, I mean, as, as brilliant as she is, it's not a real, it's not a typical subject for any kind of pop song, but those, songs, no. those, it, it's interesting yeah. that they chose Fa 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 over those other songs. It just was, there just had to be something that connected to that song on a corporate level yeah. that nothing else could have. Yeah. And, I, and again, I don't, I don't quite get it because like in hindsight, a lot of people say, oh, they do sound like talking heads. We really don't. But that one song. Sounds a little bit like Talking Heads, of course, but it also sounds like television's, you know, Marky Moon. Yeah. Right. That, that's where the kind of the riff. That's what I was thinking about when I did the, you know, all that, right? And and also like the basic riff. I was thinking Marky Moon by television, and then I thought, that's how I recorded the voice, by the way. The right, the reason why it's called Fa 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 is because I didn't bother to write lyrics to that part. So it's not it's not called Fafa Fa because it's really like a big tribute to Psycho Killer. However, Psycho Killer, when he says Fafa Fa 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 Better, is a tribute to Otis Redding's song called Fa 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 the Sad Song, you know? Yeah. So that made sense. But to me, but to, and, and what's really interesting about that song in two thousand and two thousand and five, nobody was listening to Talking Heads in two thousand and five. So, you know, for to, for us to pay tribute to to Talking Heads on that song is was as weird as paying tribute to to Laurie Anderson and mind you at the time Laurie Anderson was still touring as Laurie Anderson so for us to to pay tribute to Talking Heads in 2005 that didn't happen like 2006 and 7 suddenly you started hearing remixes of uh, you know once in a lifetime or whatnot because the whole indie dance came back and new new wave became new rave and all of that you know <laughs> But yeah, it, it, it's a one of a kind on the album. It's very different to the rest of the album, but it's equally just a fanboy kind of song where we pay tribute to kind of Talking Heads and the New York scene of the late seventies, mid late seventies, and it wasn't a hype at all back in two thousand and five, six or seven. So I never got it. I don't understand why they picked it up. What else does it remind you of? Perhaps a tiny little bit about something like Peter Bjorn and John's, you know. Uh, or 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 same in mobile disco. Or, uh, I don't know. The bass riff is really easy to remember, and it's easy to say fa fa fa. Mind you, fa 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 isn't mentioned until three point five minutes into the song, <laughs> so it's not like we're opening with the chorus singing fa right. fa fa. So, so everything about this is odd. And and think about this: it's not just a few commercials. It's the competitors. It's Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Samsung. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, that's that's incredible that that I mean, were there bidding wars to get the, the licensing for this song or what happened? Well, I mean, as I said, we were kind of business savvy enough to get good representation. Right. So we got the uh, well, it wasn't exactly a bidding war. But of course, our representatives started saying, well, you know, this is a very valuable song and you have to pay up, buddy boy. You know, <laughs> but like the but the co like the Coca Cola ad. I mean, we never saw that money because what we decided is just like like this is fuck you money. Right. This is this is money we can spend on music videos and touring to places that you know we can't really afford to go to, and you know start recording a new album and all of that. But then we, I mean, we started for the first for the first time of our lives we started making a little bit of money on data rock because it was really a hobby project for like 8 years so it wasn't a bidding war but it was certainly an important part of our income <laughs> oh i would imagine but you know it's funny cuz you know at, at that point a lot of artists yeah. were seeing their music kind of being you know used in that way like moby for example you know that That's album... a, that but the, yeah and that and 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 then it's a very interesting story because Mo, um, moby was I mean, it's pretty oral about being a, a vegan, right? Right. It's pretty polit. He's a polit political artist, 
Yet all of the songs on that particular album were sold like 10 times each, something like that. <laughs> and that was shocking that a political artist like him did that because when we were sitting in this backstage room in, in, in Amsterdam getting a phone call for Coca-Cola, you know, w when you're in a punk environment, that's not a cool thing to do. That's a complete sellout, totally. you know? Back, back in 2005, that was not easy for us to just uh, jump uh, on it. Because cause you, you were really, and also, you know, if you if you made money in music, that really meant that you made shit music. That's kind of what it meant back in 2005, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the reality is that's not true at all. No. You can, you can say that Moby sold out, but, you know, Moby never has to work again for the rest of his life. No, but the, also, I, I agree with you. And to me, it was, I, I think, because we, cause we obviously we ended up having some discussions about it, right? But. But I just said, okay, so what exactly is the big difference here? We 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 wouldn't stop a commercial radio channel broadcasting our songs. Right. Now, that's a, a, as commercial of an entity as most companies. And, of course, there is some stigma connected to, to, to Coca-Cola. I mean, all big companies have, you know, some tr troubling stories around them. But, I mean, most of the companies you work with as a... With as musicians have some difficult sides, right? Even if you work, if you if you play on a festival, what about everybody who works there voluntarily? Are they are they insured? Like how is how is um, employment the status for people working at the clubs, the festivals, the whatnot? You know. Also, like when it comes to the environmental stuff, I mean, seriously, we played shows in thirty six countries. Our carbon footprints are so dark, you know. <laughs> so, so to us, it was like, okay, we, if we want to be realistic, this is perhaps the only way we can can generate an income, like a surplus that we can reinvest. This will be it. And also, what is it really but an alternative radio? You know what I mean? If we put a song in a in, in a video game, uh, say for instance, we have songs in ten of the different FIFA games, right? Um, this is how they calculate it themselves in EA they say each sold FIFA game is is played for 100 hours by 2.5 people right so presumably 100 times 2.5 people will hear us per sold game which is 10 times 10, 10 million then it's equally many pirate copies so then you have 20 times 100 times 2.5 that's how many times your song get a spin just on one video game H how can that not be amazing that is like having a radio hit. You see, you well, I was going to say that. I mean, it's really a matter of your perspective. If you had an album that sold 20 million copies, you know, there's always going to be some mm -hmm. people who will say, well, you sold out, but that's not, yeah. that's not your fault that happened. You know, you just put out a, a really good album. It's really what the market yeah, dictates. Yeah, 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 but you told, yeah, and that's the other thing I wanted to point out. I mean, uh, uh, all of these synchronizations with Daydog happened after we made those songs. Sure. And we made them with no management or intent to to sell them as uh, as synchronization, right? But I think perhaps, you know, when you when shit like that happens to you many, 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 many times, and then you go back in the studio and you're thinking, hmm, what which song are we gonna spend a week producing in a studio that costs, you know, a thousand dollars a day? Or we're gonna go with this song that is likely to end up in a synchronization, or we're gonna go with this song that we don't think is gonna get end up in a synchronization, you know? Right. So eventually it comes and bites you in the ass. And and the interesting part of that is that every time we we release something that we thought would, you know, be synced, we didn't on purpose try to write songs that could be synced. But in, it's hard to not be affected. You know what of I mean? Of course. None of those times when we tried <laughs> anything happened. It only happened when we didn't give a fuck. <laughs> it's really funny, huh? It is. I mean, it is funny, but it, that's. I mean, that's kind of the way any, any successful artist. Cause it comes when they least expect it, or like like a song that you know you hear this you hear this time and time again. An artist will write a song. It's did like you know it took them thirty seconds to write it. That's the song people remember, not the one it took them a year that's and a half to write. Blah, blah. It took yeah. thirty seconds to write. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it's that song. The other songs like the songs like that sound like sound like super dumb. We spent like super, you know, long, long time, sometimes years making some of the songs. But that fuff of fuff took like 30 seconds. Yeah. It has something really hilarious about the song. This is really interesting. When we made that first album, I mean, we, did, we, we didn't have money. That's just how it is. We didn't have any sure. money. We were students and we're dirt poor. But the, but the producer of the studio, he was a dear friend of us. And he, and he used to be a singer in basically a punk band. 
So we told him, hey, we don't have any money, but I mean, people seem to care about their work and I'm pretty sure we'll sell some albums and we'll pay you if we get some money, you know? And he, and he was just like, yeah, whatever, cool, let's do it. And then we recorded the album and we, di we didn't even have money to pay him, right? So, so he produced it without getting a fee, just the promise of getting paid if we ever could, you know? So th therefore, we had to do it very effectively. And fa 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 was recorded and then you do a you do a mix down right just from the desk from the day you record it and and then later on when the songs were done we were mixing all the songs over and over again and but fa 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 we opened it was like we were like fuck it that's okay it's, like, it's okay like it is right <laughs> we never mixed it what we re released is just how we recorded it and how the setting on the desk was when we recorded it. we never even mixed the motherfucker <laughs> it's hilarious <laughs> You know what I, I, I really have enjoyed about you know listening to the music and getting really familiar or, or a lot more familiar with it than I had been is it sounds like you guys are having so much goddamn fun making these yeah. these songs. I mean, there's a sense of humor about it. There's there's a there's a sense that the music is serious, but you're not taking yourselves too seriously. It's so yeah. refreshing to hear that because so many times you it, when in music you see. You know, some guy just becoming this cliched mouthpiece of some sort of political agenda that means nothing yeah. to nobody, as yeah. opposed to just a piece of entertainment that people can absorb and really have a great yeah. time with, which I think was really the point of doing this in the first place. It's just so much fun to listen to. Thank, thank you. I, that re, re, I'm really happy you, you point that out because that's really what we, we, we've been hoping for Data Work to be. And to be honest, I mean, I mean, we're pretty serious grumpy group of guys i mean we live okay look out the window it's been raining it's been raining for days this is this is where, where i live bergen norway it, without exaggerating it's raining 230 days a year okay <laughs> and, and it's freezing cold yep. and 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 in addition to the 230 days of rain you have probably 50 days of mist <laughs> like, you know it's, it rains more than 230 days a year and also i mean we, we all have i mean we all have university educations and one of the guys has a phd and you know we're, we're the, cl the classic grumpy motherfuckers right <laughs> and and for, for us did work was kind of our way to have fun and that's how we started the band for instance i said okay i mean i'm in if i don't have to sing and not play the guitar or write lyrics i just want to play drums and i, I can't even play drums and that's how i <laughs> sort of joined the team because i was i just wanted to be the drummer but then the guy who was supposed to sing got divorced from his norwegian wife so he went back to boston <laughs> a guy called uh, kevin o'brien by the way and his group of friends back home was the guys from bloodhound gang in that kind of environment sure. right so so the guy who was supposed to sing he was like uh, this um like a beatnik like a, you know an, a late 50s beatnik character i was just gonna supposed to play the drums and then and then it ended up with me you know singing and and writing the the, the songs and stuff but we didn't start off with with that as an intention because I was in music high school. Oh, I was one of those guys who went to music high schools, you know, mm -hmm. like my my guitar exam, the guy who, who gave me a five out of six on, on my guitar exam had the front cover of guitar player internationally that year, you know, so so my background when I was a kid was kind of I was one of those nerdy instrument kids who probably dreamed of going to Berkeley or something like that. Right. And then I got so sick of that way of taking music seriously so i actually stopped doing music for many many years and the reason why we fired up data work again was because something really interesting was happening in the club scene where you had like a mix of intelligent young people who might be a mix of you know art student or well university students or you know conservatory students or architect student the authors and whatnot who came together and created this new alternative club scene, which I think in the US was probably very similar to Norway with like Miss Shapes in New York City. And we had like a mix of, you know, late 70s, early 80s, like No Wave, New Wave, uh, Depeche Mode, you know, uh, Joy Division, Ibar uh, you know, Tom Tom Club, Devo, mixed with new techno and electronic music, right? And that whole scene became sometimes it was you know uh, aggressively um, 
political. You had like you had a lot of U.S. female groups. Well, Canadian peaches. You know what? What are they called? What was it? Someone called was someone called lesbian dopeds or mopeds, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Detachable penis. I don't know exactly. King missile. Yeah. But you had a lot of you had like suddenly you had this very uh, 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 an interesting punk club scene that was that reminded me of how we started doing music which was thrash metal and thrash metal when we were kids thrash metal was in, in norway it became black metal and, and those are the guys who kind of i think misunderstood thrash metal and didn't understand that it was supposed to be fun and it became a little bit too seriously <laughs> you know you you know burning churches isn't what they were doing in california when they did thrash metal you know right <laughs> but what happened with Deadwork is we saw how much fun that alternative club scene kind of reinvented and we felt really comfortable in that world because it reminded us of the punk rock thrash metal kind of hardcore background we had and we were kind of adults already because we were like 25 and suddenly it was like an adult smart ass but dumb as fuck fun <laughs> club scene you know and that that's the only reason why we started the band because we we thought well, that's a fun scene that we want to be part of that scene. So so that's kind of the whole kind of argument for us to do Derek has been for for us to have like a, a fun thing in our lives, our, our personal Prozac and the inspiration. What really has inspired us throughout all these years is the thousand shows we, we have played in 36 countries because we've kind of seen ourselves in the audience. Right. 18 year old grumpy kid was actually happy and shouting and dancing. And at the end of the show, he's swinging his T-shirt and he leaves the place with a girl, you know? And and that's really what kind of kept us going, that we saw that we, brave, we brought a lot of joy and happiness to a lot of people who perhaps don't usually have fun that way. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, I think as a member of the audience, when you get a sense that you're being entertained and the artist actually wants you to have a great time as opposed to yeah. he's doing it just for himself. I mean, you know, oh, man, yeah. it's, I mean, it's expensive to go to shows, you know, here in the States, it's, yeah. it's very expensive. When you don't get that, you kind of walk away feeling, you know, I'm, I've, I've kind of been cheated here a little bit, which, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is interesting because I've, I, you know, I've seen a couple of videos of you guys playing live. And I think the, the, the yeah. fun part about it is, you know, never mind the fact you're all in the same colored tracksuit or whatever. You're actually putting on a show. I mean, it's it, yeah. these are exciting performances, which I think kind of adds to what you're you're talking about. It's like you're there to have fun, and it's kind of hard not to have fun when you see that being reflected on a stage. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so many people ha have told us that, and uh, which is also inspiring, of course, right? Because uh, so many people ha have told us that exact thing that it's so. It's such an um, infectious effect when yeah. you see people on stage having fun. And, and, they, and we clearly want to spend time together and we clearly make each other laugh, you know. And, and, but I have to say, because of the suits, it's a little bit easier for us to get into that character. So, so I mean, you know how if you meet an old ex-girlfriend, how kind of time has stood still because you haven't seen that person more than put together for perhaps a few minutes or hours since you broke up 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> you know, t time stands still, right? Okay. I only wear that motherfucking tracksuit when I'm on stage and I've, okay, I've done a thousand shows in that tracksuit, but it's only a thousand hours, right? So every time I put that tracksuit on, I basically that guy from 2005 like this, Yeah. right now I'm 47, but when I put on that tracksuit, I'm not, uh, you know, it's, it's such a transformative thing put on the tracksuit and especially putting on the glasses. So I think it makes it the, the whole thing with the costumes and the fact that we have the same clothes and, and over time, you know, some routine to what we do. And we kind of snap back into that mental state that we were in when we were, to, you know, a hell of a lot longer. <laughs> well, I can imagine like how the band Kiss must have felt, you know, when they, they were wearing makeup yeah. for years and all of a sudden they said, nah, let's, let's, let's be like a regular band and like everybody else. And suddenly people stopped giving a shit because it wasn't, it wasn't what they wanted and they weren't living yeah. up to the hype of what they used to be. It's like that, that costuming, that, yeah. that, that the uniformity of it. Yeah. That was really yeah. a part of the excitement of those shows. 
Man, totally. And and I mean, I mean, uh, there must be a good reason why they did this. It, it must be because it must be some reason. Like, for instance, perhaps they didn't get laid as much or something. I don't know. Why the hell did kids remove their track, their, their <laughs> costumes? That's absurd. <laughs> I don't know. Stupidest thing ever did. But, by the way, they they played their very last show in Norway recently. It was people were so emotional about it. Like like our drummer actually went to five of their kiss cruises. He's a fanboy. He is a fanboy. But the, but I'll tell you one thing. We we once did a tour without the jacksuits, and you don't want me on that stage. You want that guy, you know? You're right. Yeah. It just didn't work. It didn't work. You know, it didn't work. Yeah. Well, I mean, can you imagine like Devo and jeans and T-shirts? Like, you know, no, it would never happen. <laughs> it would be it would be so it would be so wrong. And and I mean, it would be so wrong. <laughs> like we we were hanging out with Devo just a couple of weeks ago because we're playing in Norway and we're said you won't believe this uh, I, I don't know if the, I shouldn't say anything I'm just going to say it anyways so so we're because okay so when I mixed this late, latest Dead Rock album I was actually staying at Jerry Casales place in Santa Monica when we were in the studio with Mark Rankin in, in Malibu so so I know him really well and then when, when they came to Oslo they were just in Oslo for like less than 24 hours and so we only got to see see them right before they went on stage, and then they basically left again. And you won't believe it. I came backstage, and I think they were like, they were a little bit ill, right? And I mean, Jerry is he's seventy five. Yeah. Right. So so one thing is, if you're ill, you you know, I would probably just call you cry maybe. But if if you're seventy five and you're ill, you know, entitled to be ill. And I was like, oh, I was worried. He's a super nice guy, but. I was so worried because, I mean, the, the guy's going to be on stage for more than an hour screaming and shouting. And, I mean, they're dancing. And and, and he's, their whole show is is fun and all. But, it's you know, it's pretty aggressive. It demo, it's pretty demanding stuff, right? So we, we say, okay, good luck, man, and hope to see you after the show. I'll hug it out. And I leave this. Well, and Mark Modlespo was there, too. And, and he's also 70-something, right? Yeah. And they were a little bit tired because they've been doing shows every day. And then they go out on stage in those costumes. And they did a fucking killer show at what what are their age? 73 yeah. and 75. They put on the suit, they do the thing. You could nobody could tell for a second that 20 minutes before they weren't feeling good, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. So it's it's very transformative. It's very, very transformative. It's a good yeah, it's a good trick. But I mean, a, a lot of people do. A lot of people do use co costumes without even us noticing. Like, for instance, I know a lot of the Norwegian black metal artists. You won't believe how normal these people are in real life. Like, they're the sweetest, <laughs> most intelligent, super nice guys. And then they put on that makeup and then they transform into this person, right? Same thing with a lot of, I think it's like that with a lot of different artists that, well, they go through this transformative thing with, if it's makeup or if it's clothes or whatever it is. But I mean, we couldn't be bothered putting on goddamn makeup, man. You know, the track, <laughs> but the no, track suits are are good enough. But, yeah, totally. But, it's even you know almost too much. Yeah, <laughs> but but you're but you're totally right about that. So so I've interviewed uh, you know Jerry, and and he was everything I wanted him to be. You know, a yeah. lot older than I remember him, but he was everything I wanted to be. He was he was very cool. Yeah. You know, he, he yeah. was in an environment that looked you know, very futuristic, and we talked about de-evolution for like a good twenty minutes, and it was like that's exactly yeah. what I wanted to get out of him. But on the other hand, you know, there's but it, no, but it, but it, but it's also, I mean, it's very interesting with, for instance, Jerry, because you, have you noticed he doesn't even have gray hair? No, it's his, it's his natural hair color, and we can just <laughs> imagine how they lived. They they released their first single on the same label as. Sex Pistols in 76 on Steve Records. Right? And they were part of, you know, the CBGB scene and also like the, the, you know, the pretty successful entertainment business in the 80s. So you must assume they weren't like particularly healthy guys, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you meet those guys, you meet those guys and you meet Jerry and he has the energy of a kid. Without a doubt. Without, without. He question. has such youthful energy, man. It's yeah. like, it's so inspiring. And that's happened. I've I've seen that a, a, a couple of times. You know, where like someone who has been in it for so long, they just get so energized by by performing and getting back into it. Like yeah. a couple of years ago, I talked to uh, Russell Mail from Sparks, same age. Yeah. In fact, they may be even a yeah. little bit older than Devo because they've been around since early seventies. And I saw them live, and these guys were like just a few years younger than my than my father, who's eighty. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what the 
fuck are they doing yeah. this? Because I can't even imagine, yeah. like, I can't even imagine my 80 year old dad being in that position to be dancing on a stage no. for two hours. Unbe- just unbelievable natural yeah. adrenaline and energy. It's yeah. unbelievable. But I, I, but I also think, I mean, even, I mean, of course, doing what you love and getting, you know, positive feedback and all of that, all of that energizes you. But uh, yeah, I find it bewildering. Even even people that we know have been through like you know decades of substance abuse. Mm-hmm. You see someone like I mean seriously, if you see Nick Cave live on stage now, and then you go back and look at footage from when he was young. It, I mean, it's amazing that the guy is still alive. Sure. You know? But then you, but then you see the guy on stage, and there is no doubt about it. He's better than ever. Yeah. He, he is better than he ever was. And the most absurd part of it is, he fucking looks younger. <laughs> he, he looks like a young man. Okay, my eye vision isn't perfect, but he looks, his body language and his energy and his expression and his, uh, his you know, ex- well, extreme presence and how he can, you know, he can make, you know, 20,000 people be dead silent for one and a half hours. You know, the guy doesn't even have uh, um, in-ears. He doesn't even have wedges. He does the entire show on side fills. And he's he must be seventy. And then you, you see see a guy like like David Byrne. I mean, David Byrne is amazing. Like the, on on Saturday, I saw John Lydon with Public Image Limited live yeah. in London. And I mean, that's an unhealthy character. But he was amazing. He was, you know, as amazing as. Have you heard the Public Image Limited live in Paris album from nineteen seventy eight? Sure. It, it was it was just as good. The guy must be 72 or something like that, you yeah. know? It must be something about music. But, I mean, it's also, I mean, we don't exactly work in a coal mine. I mean, we are kind of privileged. But there's, you know? but there's occupational hazards along the way, like you like you said. I mean, whether oh, yeah. it's substance or, you know, just time or bad health. I mean, just, it just, the human body's not built to sustain that kind mm. of stuff. Yeah, no, and it's a lot of, a lot of, okay, of course, substance abuse, but also there's a lot of psychological issues, right? Sure. And, um, of course, which is, of course, there is a link between, well, I mean, of course, what came first, but psychological issues and substance abuse, right? But, right. Uh, yeah, you're right. And that's been also, by the way, extremely interesting to see from our perspective, because, I mean, even though we played in 36 countries and we played crisscross America so many times, I think we did 23 tours in America. So it's it's very easy, very interesting to kind of come to the same part of every town around the world. You know, you kind of meet the same group of people, kind of in right. in every country, every town, everywhere we go around the world, and it's it's very interesting to see how different the same scene is from country to country like in the like in the us you 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 know very rarely you get the feeling that it's a lot of drugs in the us very rarely okay of course it's weed but the but whatever right but then the uk man oh my god that is a laboratory you know <laughs> <laughs> and and the same thing with australia it's just crazy yeah. dude. it's like absolutely mental like even new and people are just fucking wasted on whatever pills that i don't even know the name of you right. know but, so it's very different and then it's also interesting to see how this alternative music scene is very young in some places but then some places uh, the average age might be 20 years older yeah. So, for instance, if you if we play for the same kind of audience as we would in, say, Los Angeles, and we play for the same kind of audience in, in for instance, Buenos Aires, the average age might be 15 years older, but it's the same vibe. Sure, it's very interesting. So, yeah, so yeah, so it's been it, it's being in Dead Rock has been a you know a wonderful way to experience this planet of ours because oh, we, we've really been everywhere. Like we've been places that I didn't even know existed. Like. Winnipeg, Canada. Who goes to Winnipeg? You know, <laughs> even people in Winnipeg don't want to go to Winnipeg. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I think you're right. There well, is actually a very, very fascinating documentary from Winnipeg called 40 Years of One Night Stands." And one night stand doesn't mean sleeping with a woman for one once only. It, it's it's a expression from stage performances that toured and only did one performance in each town. And it's a very interesting documentary about uh, the ballet in winnipeg so when i went to winnipeg because i'm such a goddamn weirdo i knew about this and i actually went to the ballet in winnipeg so i kind of got something out of it so it's fun even going to winnipeg you should go everywhere once yeah 
I mean, I, just the idea that there's ballet in Winnipeg. I, it's like you're watching like you know ballerinas wearing you know Gore-Tex parkas just to stay warm while they're dancing. <laughs> no, but it's a funny story and it's very inspiring. And those kind of stories is, for instance, with Data Rock, I've done a lot of lectures and shit, like inspiration talks at all sorts of crap because because um, we took a little interesting weird ass project very very far, right? And it, and of course. Uh, We've been, you know, what's the word in endurance? I mean, going through that hundreds and hundreds of shows without really making any profit or making any money and living off, you know, backstage food and beer. That's um, that's actually a lot of fun, but it's also it takes a certain <laughs> kind of person to sort of bother to do that, you know. And and one of the kind of inspirations is for instance shit like that little ballet in winnipeg because what happened is that these upper class women from the uk they were so ignorant that they didn't know about the depression in the us <laughs> so they went to the us for, for fortune you know <laughs> and then they came to new york and it's like oh shit big mistake so they by some random accident they ended up in winnipeg and the only thing these two women knew how to do was to teach ballet so so in the so in the thirties they start this little group of whatever I mean who how many people lived in Winnipeg in the thirties must be no one right <laughs> but then the documentary is it follows them from the thirties to nineteen eighty one when they by definition was officially regarded as the best ballet in the world in front of the Bolshoi Ballet in in in, in Moscow right. and that's just how it is and their and their prima ballerina Diane Hart or whatever her name was. She was the prima ballerina of the world that year, and and that's I, I love those kind of stories, and I and I really love how kind of Dade Rock ended up with a little bit like a fairy tale story like that, you yeah. know, against all odds, this weird ass project that we do in this tiny tiny little city in Norway, we end up playing like you know fucking, you know, Reading and Leeds and. Lollapalooza and Hurricane and Roskilde and Coachella and you know Jimmy Kimmel Live and <laughs> end up on like best songs of the year in Rolling Stone magazine. Like how the hell did that happen? Yeah. You know. So that's kind of what I almost found the most fun with Data Rock. How it's almost like well the little guy against the world and hey we made it. You know. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be a goddamn big deal. I don't give a fuck as long as we're having fun and we're still friends. I'm happy. Yeah. You know. And I don't. I, I never understood people who made a, a fortune on music. I, I I don't even understand how you can get. How can you make a fortune on music? Like every every time you hear about someone who makes a fortune, you, you see their entourage, and they're like, "Hey man, if they go down the street, there's like 27 people following them. Sure. If everybody is on a payroll, wh wh how the hell do you support your goddamn lifestyle? I'll tell you one thing, brother. That money is gone before you even see it. Of course, you know? it is. yeah. I do want to ask you about the new record, and we've, it's taken a while sure. before we got there, but sure, sure. the media consumption pyramid is just great. There's some songs on there that I really enjoy, TikTok, uh, Video Store, Metaverse. They're all really great. I think one of the things that, that I really like about it, is, and it's it's true of all your music, there's a, there's a retro futuristic vibe where everything is still very much in the present. That's not an easy thing to pull off, and I think that I think no, the record yeah. is, is awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, it's, it's it's easy for us to be retro because we're adults. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so, so what we really do know kind of by heart is, you know, is old shit. So, so that's how that goes. But yeah, we, we we're re really trying to not be too sentimental about the past, you know, because the yeah. past has already happened. And uh, and yeah, we we do try to kind of try desperately to, to live uh, now, and that's also how we ended up with that. You know the lyrical content, which gave the song the, the album the title "Media Consumption Pyramid," right? Because it, it, it really, in honesty, if you listen to the music, like say a song like "Discobedience," that's straight out of no wave, New York City, in 1978. You know, and and something like uh, if you listen to something like "Metaverse," it's like it's not you know it's not insanely far away from even Chemical Brothers when they were called Dust Brothers in '92. You know, right. <laughs> so I don't know if there is. A lot of hardcore 2023 elements to the album, but we certainly didn't want to sort of paint ourselves in a corner because that's what because we did everything ourselves. You know, we, we produced it ourselves, recorded it ourselves, and and producing is really making those million 
editing decisions sure. that a co-producer or engineer does. And very often, if you read about an album, you realize that, oh, so those two electronic producers that you thought made the album, they're two out of 50 people who worked on that album. You know, yeah. that's very often the case, you know, and and sometimes you read about, OK, oh, no, none of the beats were programmed by the people involved in the band. It was just these professional doctors with uh, doctor's uniforms in a doctor's studio, kind of, <laughs> you know, performance surgery so, on music. Yeah, yeah. But we, we, we just did everything ourselves. And then and then I realized that uh, I don't want to live in a world where, I, where I'm completely isolated. Right. So that that's how I sort of came up with the idea of talking to our mastering engineer in, in England who's called Mike Marsh. And he he is uh, he's such a goddamn legend. He is he is uh, he's a magician. What he yeah. does is I really don't understand what the hell he's doing, but he does something that makes everything sound so goddamn amazing. <laughs> and and we've been a lot of back and forth with him because he's been mastering a lot of our stuff since 2016 or even before. And this time I reached out to him and I said, "Hey man, you know, every time I ask you if you can you like push the, the low end or whatever frequencies that you say isn't there, so you can't do it because our mix is so bad. Like, <laughs> if it was up to you, who would you prefer that we worked with for you to get what I uh, what I think you're getting, but you're not getting? Like, how do we make sure, sure he gets the best possible mix? Like, who should we work with? And then he mentioned Mark Rankin. And he mentioned, because he used to work with Mark Rankin. Because now Mark Rankin is famous for having produced Adele and the last album for Queens of the Stone Age and Weezer and Florence and Machine and all of this. But he was a mastering engineer at the exchange. And he, and he was just one of the engineers that together with Mike Marsh. So, th so they're old pals. Right. The first thing he ever did as a producer and mixer was, I think, Block Party. Do you remember Block Party, that yeah. London band? Yeah. So, so, so anyway, so they're old friends. And that's why Mark Rankin kind of perhaps bothered to pick up the phone. Because we said, because we said, we're an indie band. We're we're on our own label. We don't have a, a huge budget or anything. But we have plenty of time and we have lots of songs. So if you can give, give us a good deal, we can give you a lot of songs. You know what I mean? Something like that. And then, so via Mark, Mike Marsh, our mastering engineer, we ended up working with two of the world's most celebrated professionals of of their trade. Sure. You know, Steve, Steve Dunn has fucking five Grammys, and it's not not by chance. And it, 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 what's interesting about it is also he doesn't have Grammys from like the 80s or 90s or 60s. He has he even uh, Chemical Brothers last album called No Drug Geography was even rewarded with the Grammy for best electronic album. And was it 2021? That was his album. And this is a really important thing to keep in mind is it's very creatively positive to bring other people into the equation. It really is because should one of these people say something that you really don't like you can always say i don't want to do that i don't want you to do that right so actually that's the opposite right every everything they contributed with is so important you know i, I have to tell you a fun story like for instance on <clears throat> on heart shaped circle we made some some beats and even though data rocks uh, drums and beats and all that sound very simple it's so many channels you can't believe it just for instance a song called california has 102 tracks so it's 102 individual sources of sound on wow. <laughs> most of them in stereo so, so even our drum tracks is like you know it's it's analog drum machines it's of course soft synths and it's of course program but it's also live percussion and live drums and you know it's a hell a hell of a lot of stuff in most simple of data rock songs anyways so steve dub calls me late night one evening from from liverpool and he says hey i'm, I'm working on hard shit circle and the drums are a little bit jingly jangly so i said okay if i fix it and i've fixed it so many times so i'm assuming he means just moving about wave shapes a little bit so they're in line or something like that so i'm like oh yeah sure be my guest if you bother to do that that's great i didn't expect you to spend time on that because that's time consuming and it's as, as actually not mixing it's uh, pro tools editing which is a completely different occupation kind of right so i said yeah please if you want to do that that's great next day comes and he has erased our beats and percussion and everything and just made his own right <laughs> and then and then I, I played it for a friend and i said because he he followed the entire process so he knew what mix reference mix we had done and and he was listening to it and he said okay because i said oh i'm a little bit bewildered what what do i say 
And then my friend said, but you know, what you did uh, is shit. And what he did is great. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so even though you can, in 2003, you can kind of do everything yourself, you shouldn't. You should always let someone else, you know, tear apart what you do a little and some it's, interesting. Things. It's always good to get a fresh set of ears, especially when you get like really too, too close to a project. You, you, you lose your objectivity and you start... Totally. Yeah, you get kind of hyper focused on something, and it, it may not be what's for the best. No, no, you're right. And what's very interesting when you work with with people like Steve Dobbin, Mark Rankin. I mean, these are these are really you know unique people. They're, they're not just some mixers. I mean, they're super producers and mixers and everything, right? But but what they are is they're great editors. I mean, storytellers, storytellers. So, so you, know, you know, if you recorded something and say it is 100 tracks, you know every little detail that is there and you want it to be there. And because you've seen it and you felt it when you played it yourself or you don't want it to disappear, right? But sometimes, for instance, you'll hear like amazing, say, metal albums that where the drums are very tiny and small, but they do the trick. They do what they're supposed to do, but there's so, there's some kind of small, like, for instance, thrash metal sometimes, you know? And it's completely wrong for some music, some kinds of music, that the drums are so dynamic, like you're listening to a jazz album. They're not supposed. It's not supposed to feel like you're sitting playing drums yourself. You're supposed to visually picture that the drums are over there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes that might be the case, not necessarily, but you you get my drift. And that's what these mixes do. They kind of reappropriate what is there in a way that tells the story the way it should be told. Like they put accent on the right words so the comedy works. You know they take away something so the comedy works. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, 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 yeah, so getting someone in who is basically directing, that's what they're doing, yeah. the directing. And it's really interesting with those with that, that kind of people because, I, as I said, I met John Leckie who produced Don Rose's debut and, and tons of other famous uh, records. But he told me he's not educated as a sound engineer or anything. He worked at Abbey Road. He actually worked at recordings with Beatles. But his education is as a cameraman for film. That, that's it. That's what he's trained at. So when you listen to Stone Roses Waterfall or whatever, and the way it's so beautifully layered and how the voicing of the drummer, the, you know, the high-pitched voices is the drummer singing, and how the guitars might be 13 levels of guitar and just how, how leveled it is and how beautifully the, the stories are told. That's not just like a sonic twist some knobs or whatever. It's storytelling on yeah. a very high level. So that's 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 what we did with this album. We went out and we were lucky enough to to send our our pile of dirt over to someone to clean it and make it. <laughs> and they did it. <laughs> Freddie, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And I've I've really, like I said, I've really enjoyed getting to 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 know your work and and I've really enjoyed the new record, Media Consumption Pyramid. It's 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 just awesome. I, I, re, I you know, I'm I'm so happy. I really appreciate it. You can't believe it. We spent three years making that album. To hear that is just, you know, yeah. Well, amazing. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Thank listen, you so much. Thank you so much for for spending the time today. It's been a real joy. Sure. Thank you. Hey, thanks for calling me. It made my day a hell of a lot more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I could help. Thank hey, you. hey, it's super nice. Thank you so much for the conversation and the compliments. Thank you, Freddie. Have a great day. The name of the new Data Rock album is called Media Consumption Pyramid, and I think you're going to love it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to like it, rate it, share it with all your friends. Be sure to get all the updates on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also email me at backs at rock102.com. I'd love to know what you think. Thanks to Z&M Homebuyers for their support, and thanks to you for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.